There's been a major shift in global markets reflecting challenges for investors. To talk about what this all means, we're joined by Blair Kirkhope, Head of Specialist Investments at Sequoia Financial Group. Blair, welcome to the network. Thanks for having me. Great to have you. There's geopolitical tensions growing in Eastern Europe, with markets around the globe reacting differently. What's your view on this? Very good question. So we're obviously seeing a lot of anxiety in financial markets currently at the moment in response to the crisis in, in Ukraine and, uh, versus Russia. We, um, we have seen a lot, of, um, a lot of commentary and a lot of reports coming out um, speaking a little bit to the worst case scenario, which we don't necessarily believe is unfolding. Our view right now is that um, we're seeing an initial short term sell off in equity markets and across risk assets. Um, we're, we're starting to see a rally in the US dollar, um, but we're not really facing what we believe is any major crash or anything of the kind across equity markets. All of the models that we follow um, are suggesting a, a pullback or correction into mid-March um, across Australian equities and also US equities. Um, and that's presenting an opportunity, an entry opportunity for investors at that time. And in regards to other concerns such as inflation and high interest rates, what's your view? A yeah, very good question again. So the, uh, the question of inflation and interest rates has been um, at the forefront of news over the last um, few months as we really start, started to see the inflation figures pick up, especially in the US. Um, we've seen some of the highest numbers in terms of CPI readings that we've seen for, for many decades and that's really starting to, to apply pressure to, to the central banks to react um, and to increase interest rates and the expectation across the marketplace is that especially in the US interest rates will start to rise potentially five rate rises this year, up to five or six. Um, and you know, we could easily see US interest rates above the two, two and a half mark within, within that time frame. What does that mean for, for asset prices around the world? Bond prices we think will continue to be, um, government bond prices will continue to be under pressure. We believe that we've seen the all time high in bonds and, uh, and they will continue to remain under, pre under pressure as interest rates rise. Um, but as far as equity markets are concerned, there is a bit of a traditional view that rising interest rates often leads to a crash in equity markets. Again, we don't take the same view. Historically, in uh, leading up to the 1929 high um, in the US equity market before the Great Depression, we saw interest rates double. Uh, during the same times when equity, the equity market actually doubled during that same period, during that two or three year period leading into the 1929 high. If you look at what happened during the Trump administration, interest rates rose from 1% um, above 1% to, to 3% whilst equity markets were rallying strongly during the same period. So yes, higher interest rates can cause a rotation across sectors. We've seen the tech, uh, the tech sectors in Australia and the US get hit very hard because potentially because of the higher interest rates. Um, however, this does not near necessarily suggest a long-term trend across the broader markets in, in America and, and in Australia. So we, we believe that we will continue to see those markets perform strongly. Um, and that's, uh, that's what we're looking for in the years ahead. Now, in regards to inflation, because you have mentioned on that, over in the US, it's at multi-year highs. But what comes with inflation is also a dent in consumer sentiment. How does confidence play a role in equity markets at this stage? That's a yeah, excellent question again. So confidence is something that, um, that is really the major driver, I would say, of, of markets, um, generally speaking. So capital flows, which is the key driver of, of, of um, asset price trend, is mainly driven by confidence and global confidence. Um, but when we look at confidence, it's about understanding it from an investor's point of view, not necessarily from a consumer's point of view. So if you are an asset allocator sitting at a trillion dollar um, Japanese pension fund and you're deciding um, how should you allocate your capital across the world, um, they would be looking at things from the perspective of geopolitical tensions, you know, Europe um, you know, on the verge of potential European war, um, especially if Putin does look to, to expand his horizons beyond Ukraine, looking at the Baltic states potentially. Um, if that situation was to unfold, we think you would, Europe would see a huge outflux of, of capital. So um, from an asset allocator's point of view, they will stay clear of, of places like Europe. 
On a relative scale, relative basis, the US is still by far the strongest global economy, notwithstanding all the local domestic problems that they have in the US. On a relative basis, the US is clearly the strongest economy. And so we think um, it will be the location that will attract capital um, and that will be received in the form of US dollars. So US dollar we see going higher globally across global currencies. We see US equities going higher for that reason. It's simply international capital flow fleeing other parts of the world where um, there could be a crisis unfolding and, com and confidence um, from investors is falling. Um, and even US Treasuries on a global basis compared to European bonds, we think US Treasuries will outperform European bonds um, in the years ahead because again, it will be a place to park capital. Let's go to this next level of detail. We've talked about markets. Now let's have a look at asset allocation, gold, bonds, property now, energy. Can I get your view as to how this is all going to work out in the near term? The energy sector is the, is the clear winner right now. We've seen oil, uh, WTI, which is the West Texas crude, um, and also Brent really start to break out. Um, we think th well, they have really started to enter a long-term bullish trend. Uh, there was a downtrend line, technically speaking, from the 2008 high um, in WTI crude at about 150. And we've recently, during 2021, we've broken out through that long-term technical downtrend line for the first time since 2008. Um, and that's a strong technical indicator for us when you combine that with the fundamental backdrop with what's happening in Ukraine, gas pipelines, oil pipelines being cancelled across the world, um, huge shortages of supply. Um, renewables are coming online, but the pace upon which they're able to replace the, the supply of energy from these other sources is just not going to be fast enough. So that dislocation um, across the, deply, the demand supply, ch uh, supply chain um, context is, is really going to, to drive prices higher. So energy, energy is probably the strongest sector, I think, right now across the world. Uh, precious metals, we're seeing um, a bit of a pickup. Um, the traditional correlation with precious metals is strong US dollar, is typically reflecting in a weaker commodity price. Um, but again, what we're seeing is that correlate, traditional correlation start, start to break down. We're seeing stronger US dollar, whilst gold and precious metals really start to pick up. Um, you know, we've, start, we've started to see them really turn the corner. Um, we're not really seeing a breakout at this point, but the early signs of, uh, of a turn. And so we think um, it's a, not a bad place to allocate a part of one's portfolio to, to precious metals as well. Bonds, we think it will be under pressure. Equities, again, a new entry point coming in, in mid-March. Um, and yeah, so that's what we see, maybe emerging market debt. I was going to ask you, Yeah. let's get your view on emerging market debt. So emerging market debt is probably the one place we would stay clear of. Um, our, big, our big concern there is a very large part of that sector of the market has been denominated in US dollars. So if we go back five to 10 years, there was a big hunt for yield, as, uh, particularly in Europe as, as we went to negative interest rates. So investors were really searching for yield and emerging markets was one place where they could find it. And uh, a lot of that debt, however, was denominated in US dollars. Um, foreign investors were unwilling to take emerging market currency exposure. So they were looking for yield through emerging market debt denominated in US dollars. Now, the issue that we face is if the US dollar really does start to break out, especially if tensions do really, ass or do, do, uh, really um, intensify in, uh, across Europe, then we could see the US dollar really start to break out in a strong way. And that could create problems for emerging market borrowers in terms of paying back their debt um, using local emerging market currencies, but then converted back it into US dollars. The cost of repaying that debt is just going to um, magnify significantly and does cause or create a credit, an increase in credit risk for those, for those instruments. So yeah, we're staying clear of emerging market debt. So if we have a look at the Australian share market, we are a resources rich country. We have Woodside, we've got VHP, we've got Rio. So probably not talking about individual companies, but having a look at it in terms of sectors. Can I get your view as to what potential headwinds or tailwinds we might see in the 2022? Course, yes. Australian oil companies, we think, so Woodside, for example, or companies either in Australia or even overseas who are, who are able to um, continue to offer their product into the marketplace at a time when key important players are being withdrawn from the market, especially out of Russia. 
Um, we think there are potential winners there in, in, the, in the short to medium term, notwithstanding this political push away from fossil fuels in accordance with the, the, climate, the climate change um, initiative around the world. We think the oil players and gas players that are not, um, that are not uh, facing problems with the situation in, in, um, in, in Russia right now uh, could be potential winners. As far as industrial commodities are concerned, again, we remained relatively, or I'd say cautiously optimistic. Um, we do have some reservations with, um, with the Australian domestic um, producers there, mainly because of geopolitical concerns with China. If the situation with uh, Russia does expand and we see Russia and China start to join forces, which of course we hope that does not occur. Um, and then there is always you know, an underlying risk that there could be some kind of sanctions or something similar um, you know, in terms of Australian producers trying to sell their product into China. So that's our main reservation for you know, going too overweight on Australian um, industrial metal producers. So if we have a look at this situation that we're in, what are some values and principles that investors can mull on to help navigate through these uncertain times? Our clear principle that we follow at Sequoia is following trend. We think uh, the price action of an asset is reflecting the fundamental scenario. And if you're seeing uh, a strong trend unfold in a market, from a risk reward perspective, your best bet is, is following that trend. Having said that, it's always important to always have a very clear line in the sand as to when that trend can change on a long-term basis. And so it's always important not to have a fixed mindset from an investment perspective, but to always, remain a, always re retain a flexible and dynamic attitude to the way that you manage your portfolio. A good example there is bonds, government bonds. We don't believe that it is a sensible thing for investors to have a large allocation to European government debt, for example, you know, at zero interest rates and you know, a credit risk on some of those, uh, some of those uh, European governments really doesn't um, sufficiently reward the investor. So that's a very good example of staying clear of, of certain asset classes, but trend for us is critical. All right, Blair, thank you so much for your insights. I look forward to speaking with you again. Thanks very much, it's been an absolute pleasure.